So uh, yes, uh, definitely welcome questions. Uh, please stop me um, if we, uh, together with questions, uh, I, I attempt to fill the hour. Uh, I have about 30 slides, so we'll see. OK, so I'm sure many of our speakers will have slides like this. It, 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 so I won't dwell on it for too long, but it, it helps set the language uh, that I'm going to be using. So uh, capability, the, my axes are capability and time. Uh, in that in number of atoms that we discuss in time. Uh, the, the rest of the lecture will be around here, so atomistics, poten interatomic potentials, and this is a, you can see it's a roughly a log scale. Here is an accuracy scale, which is quite provocative or maybe aggressive. So for example, refusing to give numbers, numerical accuracy to anything above, um, above actually doing quantum mechanics on the electrons. But more to the point, the way we make all of these models is that we have, some, we have some theories about the phenomena that we want to do, we want to uh, study, and then our theories are usually at the lower level, and then we test them by running simulations and seeing whether they match with our expectations. And this, of course, goes down all the way. But really, the other way of uh, doing multi-scale modeling is first principles. It's actually a minority uh, in, in science. Most of science is done top down, because you want to understand something macroscopic, something on our scale, and, and then you, you dig down only as much as you need to. But um, first principles uh, modeling is, says that we know what the equations of the world are with very, very broad uh, constraints, um, within very uh, broad bounds. So as long as you don't change an atom to another one, an, uh, an element to another one, then uh, the Schrodinger equation for the electrons and, um, and, and for the nuclei hold and uh, to do immense precision. And so the, the job of the multi-scale modeler is to, in this approach, is to work our way up from there. But of course, uh, things get uh, untractable and very complicated, and that's what the research is about. So um, I'm using first principles as a name for this approach, but actually, if you Google first principles, First principles modeling, you will find that that's not what it means at all. It means density functional theory and correlated wave function quantum chemistry. That's the, it's become a synonym. First principles molecular dynamics is when you propagate atoms using uh, Hellman Feynman forces computed from the electronic structure. But uh, I want to reclaim that word, first principles. I think the reason it has become synonymous uh, with electronic structure calculations is because um, it, it's, th there was a barrier here. People couldn't do the first principles approach beyond the electronic structure. And that's uh, what, what my, my research tries to change that. Can I have a question about your yeah, slide there? of course. Okay. So when you say, so going down to quantum Monte Carlo, are you talking more about many body effects? Is that what yeah. you're? Yeah. And then, and then you go down below, you have quantum chemistry. Uh, yeah. Are you saying that that's mainly many body? When you, you use quantum chemistry when density function theory is not good enough because you have lots of correlation effects where the mean field of density function theory and the hacks that, of course, one, there are lots and lots of research standing at each one of these places looking both ways, yeah. trying to hack in enough um, correlation to reach down here from DFT, hack your way up by exascale computing of actual DFT, so, right? So there's lots of, uh, lots of flowers on the meadow, so. Okay, Does that, okay. Um, okay, so all of these, the, the reason this stop is here is because you're treating electrons here and you stop treating electrons here. And you see that on my axis, this corresponds to a, a jump of a factor of a thousand in the number of atoms you can treat, and uh, and again, jump from a factor of a million, I put in for, uh, um, for time. Million? Thousand. It's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> it's, the same, it's, it's, it's the same fact. If you're linear scaling, of course, many of these things are not. So it's the product of atoms and time that's both constant, as long as you're linear scaling. So what we're trying to do is take the first principles idea and go up. And, and I'm going to go from quantum mechanics to potentials. And of course, one could try and go up further. And that might be uh, a topic of discussion. Other people are much more uh, expert, well, have much more expertise on that. So uh, the, essentially, what's going on before this body of work that I'm going to tell you about in this lecture is, is some uh, sort of a crazy thing if you look at the world in, in, on this axis. People are doing 
intraatomic potential modeling, molecular dynamics, but instead of using potentials, they're using solving the electronic Schrodinger equation in the DFT approximation every single time step. So they're asking the wrong question, the wrong level, and the reason is because that's the only thing that's accurate enough. Um, right, so, and this has been phenomenally successful. This wrong way of doing it, uh, you go too far down, but that's the only way you do it, is, is, is phenomenally accurate. And, and, and it's been super successful. So phase diagrams under extreme conditions. This is carbon phase diagram up to uh, thousands of uh, gigapascals and thousands of Kelvin. And you can actually find out what carbon does. Um, aqueous solutions uh, of poly polyatomic ions and the solvation structure and diffusivity and everything that you want to know about solvated chemistry um, on, in the atomistic detail. These are all uh, works, recent work, moderately recent works from top journals. Surface science has been revolutionized by ab, ab initio MD, so this kind of first principles molecular dynamics. Here's a uh, I think it's a titanium surface, and there's some molecule adsorbed on it, and you can identify experimentally, look at all the conformations, and then uh, study them in atomistic detail that is just beyond the experiment. And lots of people are doing this. So this is uh, the UK National High Performance Computing Facility. Uh, this is uh, December 2021, but actually I did look recently. A year later, it looks very similar. Um, these are the codes that are being run. This is percent use, and I've, I've made the colors correspond. So green, all the green codes are some form of electronic structure code, and the red codes uh, are, are atomistic potential codes. And you can see that MASP is 35%. It's very, very popular, very fast. And then you add together CP2K, FHIMs, CASTEV, all together, it's about 40% of the UK's civilian HPC is being used to do the wrong thing in the multi-scale sense, is to do the, the only thing which people can do, uh, could do before, uh, before machine learning potentials, which is DFT molecular dynamics. So what is DFT molecular dynamics? Very briefly, you have atomic positions, you solve the Schrodinger equation in typically the, with DFT, the mean field approximation, you get wave functions, you get density, electronic density, and from that you derive forces on the nuclei and you use Newton's law to propagate, typically, Newton's law to propagate the atomic positions. And then you essentially chuck away the information that was so difficult and so costly to get. By chucking away, I mean you don't use the, the information, the eigenvalues, the densities, the eigenvectors for anything else. You do use some of this to reinitialize the next step. So iterative solvers, yes, you get a little bit of a, uh, of a benefit uh, of, of, of do, repeating this millions and millions of times, but essentially, from a physical point of view, the information itself is thrown away. So uh, the idea is of multi-scale modeling, and first principle is that we should be able to go from positions to forces directly without computing things that, in the end, they don't use. So in the end, what we want to do is compute a V of R, a potential energy for the positions, uh, the, the nuclei, it's a mapping from 3n xyz times the number of atoms I have, r to the 3n, to r, and then I can take the gradient and just run usual molecular dynamics. Of course, this idea is not new, that this V of r should be the real one, and quantum chemists have been doing this for decades. For small molecule quantum chemistry, vibrational um, studies, uh, uh, studying vibrational spectra, uh, and, and that's extremely successful and, and matches, uh, it's very predictive too matches experiment uh, when you have experimental data. Uh, and the real question is, can this be done in general without all the super specialist tricks that quantum chemists have used for very small molecules? And in particular, can this be done for material systems, periodic systems, large systems, uh, rather than just for five atoms? Yeah, Mark. Yeah. I feel like there's one part of your argument that's not quite right. Okay. Is, uh, I think the vast majority of, of DFT calculations are not just to go to check you're saying that? Uh, vast majority by, I would agree with you, by person. So the vast majority of people doing uh, DFT are interested in other, many other things. I would, my contention is about CPU time. So a huge, huge amount it's, of. It's very not, it's, I would say it's typically not, you just get it. You want to minimize things, get structure, get electronic structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm fully with you on this. Um, my 
let me try and refine my argument to, to kind of make us agree. Uh, my claim is that most of the CPU time is wasted. And let's suppose that, okay, so, so but let, let, let's say that I'm interested in, um, in, in uh, densities and electronic properties. And if I'm, go if I'm going to be a big consumer of resources, it's because I'm studying liquids, I study lots of, min lots of geometry optimizations, and then maybe once I get there, once I have the structures that I want, I'm then interested in electronic properties. But really, when you're doing this with fully ab initio software, you're doing 50 steps of geometry optimization to get to the place you want, and then you're interested in the electronic structure of the one you want. When you do MD, I want to sample over liquid, you are throwing away 99 out of 100 steps because they're too correlated. And then you're going to take the data every 100 steps and, do, and look at the electronic properties that you care about. So it's that 99 I want to save. So I'm not here to fully eliminate the lower length scales in DFT. But I, I'm the, so I used to say that ab initio was dead. Then I used to say ab initio MD was dead. And now I'm refining to saying that Hellman Feynman should never be used to move atoms. Right, so that means that yeah, we, we, of course we still use the tool, but, but we should never move the atoms using that expensive method. We should use the technology that I'm telling you about and then do the electronic structure simulations w when you have decorrelated configurations, when you got your minima. You're sort of alternately like, nodding and shaking your head. So, uh, yeah, I think well, that's, that's the one caveat that you need to tell that to get the force. Oh, that's, that's, that's my input that's data, of course. Yeah, yeah. Just not, not move the atoms. So, okay, so this is sort of a 15 year old field, and it all started off with Jörg Baylor and Michele Parnello's paper uh, on the generalized neural network representations of high dimensional potential energy surfaces, right? And the neural networks are important here the representation, the high dimensions, and the potential energy surfaces. And uh, ours was a few years later um, with uh, Gaussian processes, accuracy of quantum mechanics without the electrons. So, this idea that uh, I've been introducing this talk with were already here at the time with slightly different maths behind it. And about 10 years uh, later, uh, I run around saying that basically the problem is solved. With some caveats, as usual, like during dialogues like this, so the short range, as long as uh, screening is good enough, uh, for a vast majority of materials problems it is, uh, then these methods provide you a workable solution, and they have changed the way we do large scale MD. Uh, to a large extent. Um, and that's what I said in 2020. And of course, since then, a huge amount has happened. And I'll show uh, some of that uh, in the second half of the talk, because these solutions, by, from today's perspective, look rather crude and primitive. And actually, there are much, much better solutions for the same problem uh, than we had uh, back then. OK, so what was the basic problem that was solved first uh, by Erg and then by others too? So it's a representation of local geometry. So uh, three, comp three ingredients, we have locality, which is that I want the force on an atom as a function of its near environment. Um, and I need, uh, that, needs to, that needs to be true, that, a f that the force on an atom can be computed from the, just from the positions of the nearby atoms. And to the extent that it isn't true, we're making an error. And th that can be quantified. And then the second one is we want to impose symmetry. So I want a representation of the local environment that is rotationally symmetric. So if I change the laboratory frame, I tell you the atoms uh, in a different coordinate system, my representation doesn't change, and therefore my answer to what the energies uh, of the atoms are doesn't change. And I want to impose permutation symmetry. If I swap the atoms in my description, nothing should change. So one could stop there and give a math talk, because actually, which I'm not capable of doing, but there are others here who are, because this already is a very hard problem. How do you give a representation of a set of points in space nearby, which is rotationally and permutationally symmetric. So this was Jörg Baylor's Michael Parnello's solution. Uh, so you develop a set of descriptors. So their descriptors called G2 was sum over uh, the atoms of this uh, little Gaussian here. It's uh, Rij is the distance to, the, to your neighbor. Rn is a set of fixed numbers that becomes a parameter uh, of, uh, of the of the model, and you get a number of different descriptors by varying Rn, and you have this eta here too. And then uh, you have a G3 type descriptor, which does the same thing to the angles. So theta i, j, k, central atom i, you have the, I, the j, k angle, again, a little Gaussian 
to, uh, to kill it off when the distance becomes too big. You sum over pairs of neighbors, and together, these descriptors were used. They are rotationally and permutationally symmetric. OK, so then uh, our solution was a bit different, at least initially. That's what we thought. It was called uh, smooth overlap of atomic positions. We place a little Gaussian on each atom. And it's a similar Gaussian here, but it, it, this is a vectorial one at this moment. Um, not a scalar one, so the R is bold here. So you you, th this solves the permutational problem because this density of neighbors is invariant with respect to um, permutation. And then to get rotational invariance, you expand this density in YLMs and the radial function Rn. You get your coefficients, little c, and it turns out that if you square the c's and you sum over m, you get this p called power spectrum, and that's invariant with respect to rotations. So the and then we use the kernel method, as I mentioned before, and the kernel is just a product of these, um, of these power spectra, maybe raised to some small power, but that's optional. And the, the two are very related. So these guys use the distances and the angles. So they first solve permutation, rotational invariance, and then they sum over the neighbors, and that's permutational invariance. If he, uh, in our case, we first sum over the neighbors, that's the row, that's the density, and then we have rotational invariance by going into this basis of um, the YLMs. Uh, and so there are advantages and disadvantages. So when you have many neighbors, then doing a double sum over neighbors here gets expensive. And by many, I mean 100, because the cutoffs here typically are not like the nearest neighbor one like I illustrated here, but maybe 10 angstroms. So in a material, if you go to 10 angstroms, you may have 100 neighbors. So these sums get expensive. And here we only have to do a single sum. But in fact, and others were, uh, uh, had a clearer understanding than we did at the time, but clearly realized that these two uh, descriptors, so the set of Gs and our power spectra, are very closely related. So um, if you take only the, uh, if you take these C coefficients, but only take L equals zero, M equals zero, and you sum them up, then that's the radial distribution function, and that's the same, as, 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 it's basically the same as the G2 in some basis. And if you take the, the full power spectrum, uh, and you sum it up, uh, then it's basically the uh, angular distribution function, which has the same information as the G3. So we arrived at it from different directions, but it turns out that the power spectrum, uh, the soap power spectrum, and these um, symmetry functions, as they were called, uh, are actually very, very closely related. They're, it's, they're just sort of expressing the same thing uh, in a different basis. It's, the reason we called it smooth overlap of atomic positions is because it turns out, and we were fascinated by this property at the time, and then later we learned more of the 19th century maths that explains it, is that when you take the product of these power spectra for two different configurations, that's the same as integrating the overlap of the neighbor densities over all possible rotations and all of space. So that's something that's not so hard to derive. OK, so all of this stuff was used in the next 10 years to, uh, to, to simulate things and build models. And I'll just draw your attention to two reviews, back-to-back uh, -back in chemical reviews. One of them uh, is a physics-inspired structure representations, uh, where it's spearheaded by Michele Ceriotti. And it basically um, goes over all the different solutions for this representation problem that have come up in the intervening 10 years and tries to sort of uh, uh, whack order among them. Uh, and the second one is Gaussian process regression for materials and molecules. How do you use this technology to simulate? And these are large papers with excruciating detail. So we have little explanations of uh, sparse matrix multiplication and how do you actually uh, use that um, to, uh, to make things efficient. Um, how you make uh, fits to not just uh, energy, not just pointwise values, but to derivatives. That becomes essential. The hellman feynman forces are the essential input, and we study how approximating a function by knowing its points or and or knowing its derivatives uh, affects the, uh, the approximation uh, with, you, during the Gaussian process. And then uh, the, uh, this is the family tree of uh, different representations that uh, Michele has drawn. Uh, lots of, these are all, of course, acronyms, but uh, if you know this literature a little bit, then all these acronyms are coming from different groups who are trying to solve the same um, uh, representation problem. OK, so uh, when I, I was uh, talking about these things in the early 2010s, everybody was sort of nodding and smiling and saying, oh, yeah, at least someone is trying these things, but it's not going to work. 
So <laughs> lots of, uh, lots of our uh, uh, friends, and probably the, the closer someone is to you, the more open the communication is, and they said, yeah, but it never, it's never actually work, right? I mean, the, the space is too big. So um, it took about 10 years for us, I think, to really believe it. And of course, a big part of that uh, was, was James Kermode, who's also here. Um, is to try and make a potential for silicon, the, the test case of lots of materials uh, modeling approaches, which works just in general for a very wide range of temperatures and pressures and all the different structures that silicon can make. So we collected lots and lots of structures uh, from the literature and made lots of our own um, and tried to create a potential uh, with reasonable resources that actually covers them all. So here's um, uh, so a, a, a key table of defects, now the writing is too small, I guess, but what you see is error bars of all the different methods, except this bottom row is our potential. And the ones on the left before the break are things that are sort of designed to be, designed to be covered, um, and the things on the right are not, and for even there, again, um, the scales are hard to read, but this is percent error with respect to DFT, and all other methods, all other attempts at empirically modeling the system will give you 10, 20, 30, 50, 80% error with respect to DFT, whereas the potential, uh, the Gaussian process potential is controllable. And then you do things like random structure searches, and this is energy versus volume curves. The different colored dots are different potentials where you just throw the atoms randomly, and the black, this is the outline of those points, the black outline is DFT, and all the other colored outlines are the previous 50 years of trying to make potentials for silicon, and the red outline roughly matching the black one. The only one that basically matches is the Gaussian approximation potential. And then James has a, a lot of experience in larger scale, multi-scale simulations, um, has, uh, has shown that indeed difficult problems like fracture of silicon complicated reconstructions at the crack tip uh, certainly come out correctly. This method is predictive. Colleagues of ours have used this to study hydrogenated silicon. These are voids opening up because of clustering of hydrogen uh, as it saturates silicon bonds. And of course, the big, one of the big impacts was in amorphous silicon science. Amorphous materials need very large uh, unit cells to study. So, uh, you make a model, you prove that it works, so this is convergence to experimental data in the NMR spectrum, and this is in the, uh, the, uh, the neutron uh, spectrum, and then you can study 100,000 atoms of silicon, and I have a, a larger set of slides about on this. So you take 100,000 atoms, uh, we claim DFT accuracy, controllable, not perfect, but good enough, uh, for the processes uh, we want to study. And then you take this amorphous silicon structure, by the way, making one, just a credible amorphous silicon cell at this size is not trivial. You have to very slowly quench it from the melt. And if you want, want it accurately, you need a, a, an accurate potential to do that. And then uh, under, after a 200 picosecond compression, you put more pressure on it um, and it crystallizes. And that's one of the unique features of uh, uh, broad, in, broadly in materials that this under pressure, uh, this, amor this uh, material crystallizes and you get the correct crystal structure that you observe experimentally after the crystallization. But of course, as usual with atomistic insight, you can actually study the process of crystallization. And what turns, or the surprising thing uh, that happens here is that this is, these snapshots are colored by uh, coordination number and you have the fourfold coordination, the purple here, this orange is the eightfold coordination of the sing, uh, simple hexagonal structure that comes at the end, but you see a lot of proliferation of this white 12-fold coordination. So this crystal structure collapses to a, um, a nearly, uh, so about 50% close packed structure, which in silicon would normally would come after uh, many, many hundreds of GPAs, but at so 13 GPA it collapses and then expands again. Uh, to form the uh, simple hexagonal crystal structure. So can I ask? Uh, of course. So these are all like sort of static computations? Or static? I mean, this, this is dynamics. Oh, yeah. This is all dynamics. Uh, like temperature? What about temperature? Like so, we, okay. So th there's uh, uh, an enormous uh, amount of uh, supplementary information here, and these things happen at the correct temperature at which the experiments are done. And if you change that temperature, then different things happen, and all of that. Studied. So, so this, the, the reason we are able to do this with 
having access to a few hundred, maybe up to a, a, a nanosecond altogether, is because these transitions are fast. So in, in this case, this pressure-induced transition. And of course, time scale is in some ways a separate issue, right? So we've, we, we are happy that we can do 100,000 atoms with, quote, DFT accuracy. If you try to do this with DFT, then you, you can't even run a single snapshot either. So uh, in the, the, the way I'm addressing time scale here is to go from DFT to a potential. You still have to run the, the Newtonian MD. And whatever you can't study with, a nan with, 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 with nanoseconds, this doesn't help you with. But there are lots of things that if I give you a nanosecond's worth of simulation time, a million time steps at a femtosecond time step, then uh, there's lots and lots of new phenomena that, that have become accessible. Can you use this to do a phase diagram, things like that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. Uh, I have a question about uh -huh. uh, examples that you did in the previous slide. Uh, this one? Right, I think there are a couple others, like cracks and things like that. And if I, uh, at the higher level, can we think of these as a generalization test? Uh, so, uh, that's right. So, in fact, the colors here are predicted uncertainties from the model. And what you see is that the way this thing was trained, um, we didn't have these large cracks in the database. So in fact, it is showing you that uh, I'm a little bit uncertain, actually, as we go to these complex structures. So it's showing you that um, you could actually go and try and refine the potential, depending on how you set your threshold. Now it turns out that in this case, this kind of structure that you see, lots of hexagons, in diamond structure silicon, but this is a heptagon and this is a pentagon. That is actually the right answer. We, James has, uh, has done uh, in his previous uh, uh, years prior to this, has done a lot of careful QMMM studies of this system. And so we know that this is actually the DFT correct answer, but this potential gets it right while it's already kind of uh, agonizing over it. But, uh, the surface reconstruction is not part of the trends so the uh, surface reconstruction of, uh, of plain, um, very small unit cell surfaces is in the training set. So anything, the, the name of this game is you, you, anything you can do with 100 atom unit cells, we throw into the database. And then the science you do is on very large unit cells. So this surface uh, in a periodic small surface unit cell version is in the database. But of course, you see it's curved, and here it has to turn over. So the structures that you're studying here are not in the database, and also this is hot. We did put a handful of crack tips in. Yeah, well. very small, very small crack tips, which, which are not like this. They don't have this sort of real behavior, but they do show the potential. What happens when you have atoms at you know, three quarters of your volume and then empty space? It's, 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 yeah. Okay, so others have, uh, of course, done this. I'm, I'm showing you my thread of, uh, of, uh, of research over the past 15 years, but of course it's become a, a, a new community and lots and lots of people are doing uh, beautiful work in this. So here in this case, um, this is Karsten Reuters group and they've taken actually our methodology, and this happens to be uh, our software, and they made a potential for iridium oxide. Um, and they're interesting catalysis. So they did global exploration of it, iridium oxide surfaces at a variety of oxidation, oxygen po chemical potentials. And it turned out that iridium oxide at reactor conditions looks nothing like as cut iridium oxide. They found completely new kind of surface structures that you see here. So this is the, in this orientation, this is the bulk. And what you see are completely strange structures. They're called surface complexions because the stoichiometry changes. And it turns out that um, some experimentalist friend of theirs had pictures in their drawer which they couldn't explain. So this is the TEM of the iridium oxide. And it turns out that these little dots here correspond to exactly to the spacing of the oxygens. Once you find the correct surface reconstruction or complexion, this is extensive uh, simulated annealing uh, on, the, on these surfaces using millions and millions of evaluations. Um, here's a, somebody's with a different method. This is, I think, uh, Jörg Baylor's uh, code, which was used 
uh, to study high pressure liquid hydrogen. So these are phase diagrams. So those are the question before. So yes, you can study phase diagrams with it. And this is the different phases of hydrogen at high pressure. There's lots and lots of debate on what happens. Uh, what are the different things that hydrogen uh, can do? And this is another example. Um, it may have come out actually since then. This is an old slide. It's Volker Deringer. Um, there's a fellow uh, in my group and now a professor in Oxford. And he's taking um, these potentials and using sort of device scale simulations with them. I think I have a bigger slide on this. So uh, the system here is a germanium antimony telluride. And uh, it's a phase change material. So uh, it's, it's, you can make memory uh, with it. And uh, the, one of the bits is a crystalline form, the other one is a amorphous form, and you, heat, you pass a little current through, and you can amorphize or crystallize depending on the pulse shape, depending on the amount of current and, for, and the timing. So here's the proof that the potential does the right thing. So this is ab initio MD of a little pulse of a small system. This is the uh, potential doing the same thing. And once uh, you do this for uh, these 200 atom systems, then you can go to the scale of the actual device. So this is what is the schematic, what it looks like. So you have these electrodes that are like this in a grid. And depending on which electrodes you um, put the voltage across, you can access each individual column. And uh, when you then, and this 20 by 20, 20 by 20 by 40 nanometer system is the actual scale of the device in reality. And so we can do MD with um, controllably quoted DFT accuracy on the actual device on the right size and the right time scale that is being used uh, in, uh, in the experiments. OK, so there are some, uh, I'm going to uh, spend the rest of the talk so pointing out interesting formal mathematical theoretical uh, developments as we go along. So one interesting feature um, of, this, um, uh, of, of the SOAP power spectrum uh, is that it scales quite badly with the number of different chemical elements. So this is, uh, it scales quadratically. So uh, I omitted the chemical elements from the previous uh, exposition, but this uh, these, these, um, decomposition of the local density, of course, I, we do with alpha and beta, so different elements contribute different, de dif different neighbor densities. And so this power spectrum not only has n, n prime, and l as its indices, but alpha and beta, where those range over different elements. So if I have 10 elements, then this is 100 times bigger, this descriptor, than before. And Although that is the, the, the full uh, description, one does wonder whether all of that is needed, actually. So it turns out that it isn't. So if you take um, your pairs of, it, it, you can make this C and that C correspond to pairs of neighbors before you, before you sum them up. And you could ask, what if for one of these Cs, I don't just sum over, I don't take just one element, but I actually sum over all elements and I get the neighbor density coefficient for all elements together. And we indicate that with this gray uh, bar here. So you can develop a whole bunch of different descriptors where you, you're not going to bastardize this, um, this descriptor and, and lose information deliberately along the way. And so sort of this particular combination where you retain on one of these Cs, one of these neighbor coefficients, the actual element identity, and the other one you don't. Um, so now you get linear scaling. You only have one index. You have a linear scaling with the number of neighbors, and that turns out to be a very, very efficient. This is a, an error plot as a function of number of data points, in fact, in the training set. And, um, and you see that this version uh, is very, very good. Um, the original one uh, is, uh, is, is, is this um, uh, red one. So one can certainly do things that help some of this scaling. So um, we were all very happy, and uh, we, are, we have our swords, we've made our tools, and now we go out and find all the nails uh, that we can hammer uh, down. Except that um, about uh, four years ago, three years ago, I was sitting in that chair over there uh, when we were discussing with Michele Ceriotti um, whether all distinct environments can be distinguished by our descriptor. And I said, well, yes, of course. That's why it's so successful. We've solved the mathematical problem of how to represent environments. And he said, no, 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 that's not true. I said, what do you mean it's not true? You're working in this too. We've been talking about this for five years. And, he said, and then he pulled a little piece of paper, very scrappy, from his pocket. And he said, a Russian master's student drew this for me. And uh, what was on the drawing is uh, sort of is on the left here. So 
atoms, central atom i, just the origin here, neighbor one, two, three, and then either you put the fourth neighbor there or you put the fourth neighbor there. It looks like a legitimate configuration of atoms, and it turns out they have the same SOAP vector, the SOAP power spectrum. What? <laughs> Nothing works. Why does it work? It must be wrong. Well, it's not wrong. This is absolutely correct, and we spent the next few years really trying to understand it. Christoph Horner uh, has uh, become uh, immediately a, a part of that uh, and, and helped uh, understanding uh, what was going on. And it turns out that the problem is there, it's severe, it's limiting uh, in the case of molecules, especially empirically. So nothing is wrong with the potentials we've made before, but in fact, if you really, really try to push them to DFT accuracy to, to kill the error uh, asymptotically, then you won't be able to because there are configurations which cannot be uh, distinguished. Uh, in fact, we've made more complicated ones. So here's the most complicated ones yet. Yes? I've seen the example several times, but I still yeah. understand it because the other atoms have different neighbor configurations, right? So when I get the total energy of the computer. No, so that's a different question. Right? So you're asking is, I'm asking whether the thing that, so this becomes a modeling question. I'm asking, I'm proposing an energy of an atom as a function of its environment. Does that object exist and is it smooth? And, and you're saying, by taking the configurations of, by taking the descriptions of all of the atoms in the system, can I distinguish the global system from one from the other? We're not yet fitting. Okay. So, okay. so uh, look, I think the fact that you can distinguish two global configurations by looking at every single atom and its local representation, um, that's a slightly different question. It, and, the, and it turns out that when we, we, we have, I'm about to show you the higher order counterexample, which defeats that question for four atoms. So this becomes a little more complicated. When you fit two total energies and you fit a degenerate model like this, you're not going to get the same total energy for this if you actually made this uh, your, your whole system. But still, you, are, you, you have a problem that you're fitting an energy of an atom and you're giving data and the object you're trying to fit, the energy of this atom, is not a smooth function. Because it, at these degeneracies, you're forcing two values of the energy of this particular atom to be the same, even though they shouldn't be the same. Does that? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a question of smoothness. Can I yes. slightly? What you're asking is just much more subtle and harder to understand. <laughs> you think the molecule is easy, I guess. It's the entire system. Well, that's even worse, right? So in a, no, it's not enough. But, but look, he, here's a, for energies, this, if I want to fit the um, NMR chemical shift of each atom, which is a number on an atom, then you definitely have a problem. Right, because then, then the total energy is actually, an, the, the, the thing you're fitting is a scalar sitting on the atom and you won't distinguish the environment. So here's the, the higher level example. So you have seven neighbors and this atom moves from top to bottom, that one from there to there, and then uh, you've actually made a little, I don't have any example here because we gave them all out, but you can put them on dice um, and we handed them out at the Psyche. Uh, meaning, so these two environments with seven, uh, seven neighbors have the same soap vector. They have, of course, the same atom-centered uh, symmetry functions. So Baylor's exactly suffers from the same thing. Um, it has, in fact, these guys have the same, not just distances, but the same triangles. So the, the snap uh, potential, the uh, spectral neighbor analysis also um, uh, gets defeated. And this was all written up uh, in a PRL. Um, there are other problems. So due to this, the basis becomes very badly conditioned. So that's a problem when fitting. Um, there are extra unwanted symmetries that come in, which, which are not property of the real system. And that is independent of, of whether you have a molecule or a solid or so on. And Michele Ceriotti has taken this whole thing further and produced periodic examples, things, examples that defeat message passing neural networks. For example, uh, Schnett is degenerate. You, they take these, give these configurations to Schnett, these two, they're not the same, and Schnett will give you the same, formally exactly the same answer. 
So uh, the solution was published a year earlier. You just have a hard time keeping up with the literature. Uh, the solution is the atomic cluster expansion, and that was uh, invented by Ralph Drauss. And it's sort of a, he will explain it in a different way, but to me it's a generalization, a vast generalization of SOAP, of the power spectrum. Basically, Ralph says the following. Let's take um, our, a neighbor basis. This is R times YLM, so radial times YLM. So far, so good. Let's sum them up uh, over all the neighbors J for a given element. So I have a Z here. So it just sums up the uh, basis at each of the neighbors. Then he takes a product of this, and he can take a product of one, two. When you take a product of two, that's soap. You get a product of three of these, that's snap. But Ralph can take a product of four, five, six, any number. It's a, it's a tensor product basis. And then you symmetrize using generalized klebsch gordon coefficients, which, the existence of which I've learned from Ralph. But it's in the very, very big book written by several Russian people uh, in the 20th century. Like, this thing is known. This stuff, this mathematics is known, and you take uh, the fact that you can take tensor products of YLMs and arrive at something that is rotationally variant is not new mathematics. But we haven't, nobody has figured out before or after this is applicable here, and it's a beautiful solution to this very general problem of how you define symmetric representations, right? I take the permutational symmetry here, I take the rotational symmetry here, and then it turned out that this is such a nice solution to the problem that you don't need neural networks anymore. You don't need Gaussian processes anymore. You can just do linear fitting. Okay, so, and that gives better answers, and I'll show you smoother answers uh, than before. And as Ralph wrote then and since then several times, it kind of incorporates many, many of the previous solutions before. So SOAP is nu equals two, so product of two of these A's, same as uh, uh, so uh, these atom center symmetry functions, the any force field, some of you might have heard of. Snap is nu equals three, as I said. Moment tensor potentials, another beautiful solution from um, Alex Shapiev, actually three years earlier, 2016, does the equivalent in Cartesians without YLMs. So moment tensor potentials are tensor products of radial, of, of, of interatomic distance vectors and then contracted in all possible ways. Uh, down to a scalar, and it, they form a, um, a spanning set of all the of symmetric polynomials, and there's a linear transformation between uh, these Bs, between the A's basis and the moment tensor potential basis. And this thing is super fast. So that's, a part, so understanding all of this mathematically, uh, my go-to man for that is Christoph, but also Christoph's implementation uh, is, is extremely fast for this. These are polynomials and a uh, century of mathematics of how to efficiently uh, implement uh, and evaluate polynomials uh, leads to ACE being very, very fast. So this is, uh, this is gap here over tens of milliseconds per atom, uh, and we can get reasonable models now 100 times faster. So sometimes 1,000 times faster, so 0.1 milliseconds per atom per core. And, and this is where I think the, uh, the solution of the degeneracy really shines, things become smoother. So here's our uh, example. It's a small molecule with two rings with three rotatable bonds when you connect the rings. So the two ring, the rings can go like this. And what you see here is the potential energy surface for a, for in the alpha, beta, and gamma angles. So this is alpha, is, uh, beta is here, and then alpha is one of these axes, and gamma is the other one. So um, and the, the white points are data, and this is the DFT potential energy surface when you relax uh, the rest of the coordinates. So this, I, the, for a given particular beta, I copy it over here, and then I show you the different fits with the diff for different methods. So if you take an empirical force field, uh, not fitted, but just the usual uh, molecular force fields, then you see that it kind of has the rough idea, but it's really not very accurate. It's, it, it, it's completely... Um, you may, uh, quantitatively, it doesn't agree. If you take gap, then you actually get better agreement. Now, that's not obvious, but, but you do get about a third of the error. Um, and you take ANI, which is Bela-Parinello descriptors with a shallow neural network, qualitatively quite similar to gap. 
what you see is that it's kind of fuzzy. So you see this, this part and this part here, this part here. These, these fits are just not nice. And then you take Ace, and it's just bang on. And it's very smooth and faster and so on. Uh, for completeness, this is SGDML, another kernel model that doesn't use any of this technology. It's simply a kernel model based on interatomic distances. For a fixed small molecule, one can do that, not for materials. So it's not a solution that generalizes, but it sort of shows that if you take these data points and you take the simplest solution of just, per, just taking a Gaussian process in the interatomic distances, you do get a very nice smooth thing. ACE gets there by doing the symmetrization, which is then allows it to generalize. The ACE formalism is applicable for materials molecules completely generally. So this is what convinced me. And this is sort of my answer to, does it matter even though I, I can distinguish maybe using all the environments? Um, maybe you can, but see the difference, what happens when you use a non-degenerate uh, representation. So uh, we have been using ACE since then. It's uh, very, very efficient, uh, both in terms of computational efficiency and in terms of, uh, of data efficiency. And I think uh, both, uh, so, so uh, definitely Christoph, maybe James, uh, will also uh, talk about active learning uh, in this context. Um, so here's the kind of thing you do. You do a simulation, and you stop it when it goes wrong. And after a few iterations of folding back, uh, you get, this is a model for a hybrid perovskite which after 16 iterations of folding things back, it just runs. And we can do perovskite science. Uh, we can do, uh, st set it off with a single configuration. This is a, a graphene set, a set of uh, graphite. And this is a set of uh, molecules comprising a battery solvent, electrode, uh, uh, the, the, the liquid that is next to the electrode uh, in, a, in a battery, in a lithium ion battery. And you can set it off with a single configuration iterate a few times, putting back things uh, which don't work, and then end up with a simulation of a very large system and study the, the ion transport and the structuring uh, near the electrode. OK, so we arrived to 2021. And, uh, and uh, we don't need any neural networks. We have a linear basis. We're going down towards uh, the polynomial mathematics. And then Boris comes along and says, no, no, no. Actually, uh, I have really good models with complicated neural networks. Works. So far, up to that point, I didn't care about neural networks because they were slower and less accurate than things we could do first with GAP and then with ACE. And then Boris says, no, 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 actually, if you take this sort of equivariance seriously of scalars, vectors, tensors, how they transform, just like we did with ACE, but if you then do an awful lot of work in using them in the right way and put them into a neural network, you get something that we couldn't really dream of before. You get extre ac extreme accuracy and, and extrapolation in a way that we've never seen before. So, uh, so that was surprising. And we kind of had to stop uh, and sit up. And, and in fact, uh, Boris was generous enough that uh, with his group, uh, he started a collaboration and to try and really understand mathematically what happens. What, why are these neural networks that uh, he was using for the first time are more accurate uh, and, and have better properties uh, than what we've used before. And it turned out, after a year and a half of investigation, joint investigation, is that what's actually going on here is that there is a little ace. And then, in fact, from that, what you do is you take a little ace expansion of uh, the neighbor environment. Let's represent that with that little box there. Then you have other atoms. You do a little ACE expansion around each of them. And then you communicate that ACE expansion in its full um, equivariant generality to all your neighbors. And then you do that a few times. And we've understood together that that is what's going on. And it turns out that that's a really, really good idea. So then you keep communicating, and that's what works. And what the kind of things we, we've seen here are, this is a, a little methanol, uh, so ethanol molecule. And yeah, we take a little data, we fit, and we get good accuracy around the minimum. And this, in this direction, I'm pulling away one of the hydrogens, actually far away. So it's, I'm testing on configurations which the models have never seen before. 
and the dashed line is DFT, and ACE is this orange line, it's got, it gets it wrong, of course. I'm way, way far away. It's never seen dissociated configurations before. And these green and blue lines are various versions of Boris's model. And it just gets it right. It extrapolates to the correct thing. If you're not entirely sure why and how it does that, but really, but it, it, these, these message pass in your networks have the capability of doing that. Uh, the next panels are uh, vibrational modes taken far into the anharmonic regime. So this is a, a, a mode of CH vibration and this is an angle. And here you can see again dashed is DFT and ACE gets it really right in the middle uh, near the equilibrium, but when you take it really unharmonic, there's no data here. This is the data histogram. And of course it gets it wrong. Why wouldn't it? This is nothing to do with the training set. And yet the message passing network models uh, follow the DFT closely. And I, we, I would say we still don't understand why, and that's what sort of exercises me these years, so what, what actually happens. The models for, are, are really good. So this is the same system as before. I'm testing uh, on these uh, on these black where these black lines are, and here black is DFT, ACE is this orange thing. It it works really well here where there's lots of data near the testing line, but here I'm testing away from the training data, and ACE has the right symmetry, the right structure, but it gets it wrong quantitatively, whereas the networks get it much much more correctly, far far into the extrapolation regime. So uh, I'm sort of about to uh, close, um, and uh, I want to highlight the, uh, the similarities, the evolution of the equations here. So just to recall that we had SOAP here, which is the neighbor density with radials and YLMs, and C was the uh, coefficient. I'm using notation that is back to the original papers. Uh, when you take the limit of sigma going to zero, so a very essentially delta functions of the neighbors, then of course you can get these coefficients by just integrating rho uh, against uh, each basis against rho, and this is the equation for the C coefficient, and then the power spectrum, as I showed before, is just the square of it. So ACE corresponds, Ralph defines the one particle basis here, um, the A, his First sum over the neighbors is the sum of the phi's. This is the product of the A's. This is the symmetrized product. And of course, this A, his A is our C. Right? You can see that this phi is just R and Y. So in the limit of sigma going to zero of the original SOAP, A and C are the same thing. And this product of C is the pair. This is, I said, it corresponds to nu equals two. So that's when you have two A's. And the point of A's is that you can do it for not just two. Um, okay, and the sum over m is, is happening here. This, I, I've collected the, the z NLM into this multi-index, but when you have only two, you, the Klebsch-Gordon becomes really simple. It just becomes a sum over the m. This is the general form, but this is sort of the same thing. And what we're working with now is a, 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 an evolved version of the uh, message passing your network, and we call it MACE, it's a multi-ACE, and this is a result of, uh, of the understanding that came out of the collaboration uh, with Boris. And the equations uh, are more complicated because of the message passing, but there's still a correspondence. So there's still a one particle basis. This is the incoming um, ACE on each ACE expansion, on each of the neighbors. There is uh, an R and a Y and a Clemens Gordon. But then there is the sum over the neighbors, which corresponds to the A's, sum over the neighbors. Here there's the product of the A's that corresponds to the original product, and there's the symmetrization. And in a message pass in your network, then you form the message, which is what you're going to send to your neighbors. That's the symmetrized version. That's the B. And then you do an update, which is you receive all the A's messages from your neighbors, and H becomes, HS becomes HS plus one, the next set of features, and I'm showing you all these weights, this is the explicit version of what actually a neural network does, uh, and then you plug the H, the A spaces back into the original. Um, one particular interesting point here is that uh, I have Zs here in SOAP and ACE, chemical elements. In the message passing neural network world, starting with net very early on, but certainly 
uh, in, uh, in Boris's uh, NECWIP solution and all the others since then, um, the elements get mapped to channels, which I index here by K, and this product is not a full tensor product over the Ks. So it's, uh, it's a trick that makes it very efficient. And since then, we've sort of understood why it works, that there is no scaling with the number of elements because there's no tensor product over these embedded uh, elements. So uh, I'm not going to bore you with preliminary results. Uh, they're coming out soon. Uh, let me just say that uh, we are in the business of creating general organic ML force fields. They look very good. They are certainly much better than uh, the, uh, what people have done before. So these are the problematic dihydro, tensor, dihydro rotations of any, uh, and we basically uh, get them all right. Um, we can do MD. This is MLMM rather than QMMM, so small molecule with ML, and then the rest with empirical, and people can do protein ligand binding with this. Um, we can do carbon. Carbon is one of the hardest things, so soap gap gets about a force error of one EV per angstrom, really big on amorphous carbon. Linear ACE decreases to 0.7, multi ACE to 0.3, and that's still far above what should be possible uh, based on DFT. Um, let me go to conclusions uh, since we're running out of time. So I think in the future, again, I'm saying we've solved the short range bonding problem again and keep improving it. Um, Inter and intramolecular interactions simultaneously are a big problem. How do you get the very weak, gentle intermolecular interactions correctly from a single fit because they control the properties of molecular systems, densities, diffusivities, and so on? That's a big problem. Uh, how do you do long range interactions? Something that I didn't talk about at all. We're just turning our attention to that. Uh, how do you do reactions? Radicals are a huge problem. Electronic structure is very complex. And of course, one can use these ideas to do higher length scales, and, and I know that some people will be talking about that, uh, coarse graining, and of course, could go, can go to lower length scales. So you can use the same geometric technology of describing your neighborhood in order to fit Hamiltonians, overlaps, wave functions, and again, uh, James and Christoph might talk about that. Um, computational efficiency is something that we strive for. So of course, we are talking about methods which are 1,000 times slower than pair potentials, maybe 10,000 times slower. So how you uh, get these things really efficient is an ongoing effort. And, and uncertainty quantification now done properly. Properly meaning systematically, the forward problem is, given a database of small structures, how does the accuracy of the fit that you can control with weights in your loss function, how does that determine the material properties? Um, right? You have, that's the forward problem. You want to predict uh, the voltage concentration curve of a battery. Uh, how do I, what do I put in the database and how accurately do I fit it? But of course, really, I want the inverse problem is that I want the voltage concentration curve. What should I put in? That's the inverse problem. Um, we're just starting to uh, address these problems is the convergence to the um, thermal expansion of silicon as a function of amount of data, and we can study that sort of convergence. Um, and these questions really couldn't be studied before numerically because we didn't have systematically convergible potentials. But now we do, and so this is, uh, this is the future. Okay, thanks very much.